Hello, everyone. This is our Tundra presentation. My name is Jeremy Ramos. I'm Valerie Escobar. And I'm Jacob Quiroz. So let's start off with our presentation, finding out where can we find Tundra. So Tundra can be found in the high latitudes in the polar regions, primarily in Alaska, Canada, Russia, Greenland, Iceland, and Scandinavia, as well as sub, sub Antarctic Island. So you will see in this image here, the ones highlighted in yellow in the map, uh, those are the regions uh, where you could find tundra. So how is the temperature in the climate? So this climate type in the tundra is very cold. Not a lot of plants and animals live in this area. Within the temperatures, it ranges from negative 40 degrees to 64 degrees. So you will see in these climographs here, uh, the black is represented as the precipitation. So you'll see a lot of precipitation during the summer times. And then as well as the orange is the temperatures as well in the summers where it gets up to 64 degrees in the summertime. So it won't be that hot, it'll just be warm. So most in these areas, it will most likely be really cold. So if you want to see a bigger picture of the map, here is uh, how I'm talking about. So uh, tundra is more likely to be the gray session, section. So you'll see in these areas here, in gray in certain parts of the area. But also, we can also see in these three other types of colors in blue. So you'll see as well in these areas here that are really cold without any dry season. So these regions will actually relate to the ones in the presentation of, you know, Alaska and Canada. So I'll give the floor to Valerie so she can explain vegetation. Vegetation. Uh, due to the tundra's biome being rigid and frozen the majority of the time of the year and not many tall plants being able to grow, this is due to not only the weather type and climate of the tundra, but the very frozen landscape and conditions are very extreme, which actually prevent large and tall flora to survive. Also, the region only receives up to 10 inches of water per year of precipitation, and the soil most of the time is in permafrost. This means that the soil is missing nutrients necessary for most larger vegetation to grow. The vegetation that we see in the tundra tends to be short and low to the ground. They also are lichens, mosses, sedges, uh, forbs, and dwarf shrubs. These tend to need a lot of water and are also a very simplistic form of vegetation. Regarding the flora, the flora of the tundra tends to stick to where the tundra is most warm and low due to the low amounts of nutrients and high contents of water. Lichens grow in the Arctic tundra regions, which would actually feed grazing animals like goats. Uh, this is due to the tundra short vegetation period, which lasts between 50 to 60 days. And the type of growth forms are rosettes, dwarf shrubs, cushion plants, and tussock um, graminoids. The reason why these are the types of plants that grow is mainly because of permafrost. And permafrost tends to do a freeze-thaw type of activity, so a thin layer active and the soil fluctuation during the warmer months contribute to strong controls of these vegetation patterns and create this mosaic type of uh, microhabitats and plant communities. The tundra doesn't really have true soil for its biome, so they don't have a lot of nutrients in the soil. Oh, next slide. Fauna. The, faun the types of fauna found in the tundra tend to be adaptive to low temperatures and very long winters, they tend to have a lot of storage, a lot of fat storages, and they also tend to hibernate during the winter. Um, these types of animals have to survive these strong and extreme weather temperatures. There's two types of tundra regions. So there's two specific types of ecosystem and different types of animals and fauna that live in those two ecosystems. Our first one would be our Arctic uh, tundra fauna, which would be our mosquitoes, 
They would contain insects like mosquitoes, moths, grasshoppers, black flies. You won't get rid of flies anywhere, not even in the colder regions. Um, and then Arctic bumblebees, the larger animals will be the Arctic foxes, wolves, polar bears, lemmings, bulls, uh, caribou, Arctic hares, squirrels. And then we have our fish, which would be our salmon, our trout, and our cod. Those tend to be the primary source of food for polar bears, or really cute polar bears. And we have the snowbirds and the falcons, which is our mascot, and they tend to reside up there. The next one would be our alpine tundra fauna, which would be insects, uh, which will be beetles, grasshopper, and butterflies. The larger animals tend to be birds, marmots, uh, mountain goats, sheep, and elk. These are the type of animals that, that live up there. There's also different types of birds and different types of other and different other different types of other animals. These animals tend to migrate. They tend to be migratory animals, so they either stay up there during our warmer months, which would be during uh, July, and where the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, then they have longer days and almost no nights during that time period and they tend to migrate south for the colder months. Animals like cold, cold blooded animals, which are like reptiles, they don't tend to live up there due to the low to no sunlight during the winter times and they would not be able to survive that type of low amounts of radiation, solar radiation. So the, these animals have to be specifically adaptable to cold temperatures. They also tend to have large amounts of fat on their bodies so that they can make sure that they're insulated during the colder months. Thank you, Valerie. I'll be going over some of the more impactful environmental issues that affect the tundra. Global warming or climate change is by far the most prevalent issue that is impacting the environment in our tundras. This is because almost all the environmental issues presented a present in the tundra come from a direct result of it. Human activities such as uh, searching for oils, fossil fuels, and creating more gases all contribute towards affecting the atmosphere, therefore our tundras. Essentially, those gases we humans tend to use in our day-to-day -day lives um, block or delay the sun radiations way back home to the sun. As a result of the prolonged presence of radiation, temperature rises. Um, the melting of ice and snow found in tundras have already and sadly will continue to affect life found there. The picture found in our PowerPoint gives a really good visual on how the animals that live in cold lands struggle to even move as they have to deal with the increased level of water due to the effects of global warming. But melting ice and snow has way more than just the effect of the way more effects than just those living in the tundras. Once melted, the carbon in them also enters the atmosphere too, which what this means is that the damage from global warming adds even more damage to the environment, creating some sort of nasty ripple effect. What's more is that the very scarce amount of uh, fresh water is frozen. So once that water is gone, it's, it's gone for good. Global warming, isn't a prediction or something we can avoid. It's real and it's happening right now. We should do our utmost to preserve the very little we still have. With that being said, um, we should, uh, we, we wanted to end off the presentation with a quote from the movie Up. It starts off with the wilderness must wilderness be explored. Must be explored. And for us to explore the wilderness, the wilderness must be saved. And this concludes our presentation of the project. Thank you.